Statins will kill you or save you. If you trust the American Heart Association, then statins are God's gift to humanity. But if you trust random people on the internet, then statins are the devil. There is a lot of conflicting information out there and it's hard to actually decide which side is right. However, plenty of long-term studies have consistently shown that reducing LDL cholesterol, whether by lifestyle changes or statin therapy, does significantly reduce cardiovascular disease risk. And this is especially true for those that have already had an ASCVD event, like a heart attack or stroke. So where did this whole statins are terrible or statins are way worse than high cholesterol come from? Most of it comes from keto influencers on social media spreading misinformation. So in this video, we are going to take a closer look at if high cholesterol is harmful and if statins are helpful. Before we start zoning in on statin therapy, we need to examine what the root of heart disease is. Whenever you have plaque buildup in the walls of the arteries that supply blood to the heart and body, those plaque buildups cause the inside of the arteries to narrow over time, which will block blood flow. This plaque is mainly made up of deposits of cholesterol. Two ways to measure plaque buildup in the arteries is by an angiogram, which is invasive and expensive, and a coronary calcium scan, which is less expensive but not a routine test you would normally get at a doctor's office. The typical test we use to check for high cholesterol is a lipid panel. You have your basic lipid panel here, which consists of LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, triglycerides, and total cholesterol. Most people familiar with LDL being the bad cholesterol and HDL being the good cholesterol. And although that's accurate in a very basic sense in terms of connecting those values with risk, there really isn't good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. See, LDL takes cholesterol to the various tissues in our body because our tissues like the adrenal glands, muscles, and so on need cholesterol to function properly. HDL, on the other hand, takes cholesterol back to the liver where it gets flushed out from the body. So if you have an excess of LDL cholesterol, meaning the cells don't actually need more cholesterol, then the rest of it will just flow around freely in the blood. This is where HDL comes in as a good cholesterol and takes that extra cholesterol from the blood to eliminate. But HDL doesn't get rid of all the LDL. An excess LDL remains in the blood and that can cause plaque buildup we spoke about earlier. The American Heart Association specifically states that LDL cholesterol plays a crucial role in the buildup of fatty deposits within arteries, leading to a condition known as atherosclerosis. This narrowing of arteries significantly associates the risk of heart attacks, strokes, and peripheral artery disease. Now, although they mention LDL as the main culprit, LDL cholesterol is merely a passenger. It is just inside the lipoproteins that carry cholesterol to the organs. ApoB is the driver. This article suggests that all ApoB-containing lipoprotein particles, including triglyceride-rich, very low-density lipoproteins, which are VLDL particles, and their metabolic remnants, as well as LDL particles, have approximately the same effect on the risk of cardiovascular disease per particle. As a result, the clinical benefit of lowering triglyceride levels, lowering LDLC levels, or lowering both may be proportional to the absolute change in ApoB containing lipoproteins, regardless of the observed changes in plasma triglycerides or LDL cholesterol. So there's a ton of misinformation out there about particle size, claiming that the small dense LDL is what is harmful and the large buoyant LDL is harmless. This is inaccurate as we just saw that any lipoprotein less than 70 nanometers in size has the ability to clog up the artery walls. This study writes, large cholesterol-rich LDL is the predominant type of LDL in familiar hypercholesteremia, and it is firmly established that this LDL is responsible for their premature atherosclerosis. Thus, large and small LDL are atherogenic, and it is not possible to judge which, if any, is more harmful overall. So we don't care about particle size, we care about particle number. Traffic jams aren't caused because there's a truck on the road. They're caused by lots of cars of all sizes hogging up the road. So particle size is mostly irrelevant, whereas particle number is very important. Now I mentioned ApoB earlier as the driver of these cars and LDL cholesterol as the passenger. Although we use LDL cholesterol as the predictor of heart disease, ApoB is actually more accurate because it tells us exactly how many cars are on the road. There can't be cars without drivers. But another thing to keep in mind is that it's not just about how high ApoB or how high LDL cholesterol is, 
but also how long it has been elevated. We can compare it to smoking. Someone that just started smoking cigarettes a few months ago is at an increased risk of lung cancer than someone who's never smoked, but their neighbor who has been smoking a pack of cigarettes for 25 years is at a much higher risk than both of them. So again, it's not just about how many cigarettes you smoke, but also how long you've been smoking. Same thing for cholesterol. It's not just about how high your LDL is, but how long it's been elevated. These two factors can exponentially increase the risk of heart disease progression. So we should be clear by this point that high ApoB levels, usually correlated with high LDL-C levels, is directly related to heart disease. So how do we fix that? By lowering cholesterol levels. One way to do that is by diet. Reducing saturated fat intake by eating less red meat, for example, is an easy way to lower cholesterol levels. But let's just say that diet changes aren't working out for you. Then statins are your next option. Before we go into the risks and side effects, let's just read this first sentence. There is now overwhelming evidence to support lowering LDL cholesterol to reduce cardiovascular morbidity and mortality. But if you don't like that, then how about this study that had over 71,000 participants concluding that adults at increased cardiovascular disease risk, but without prior cardiovascular disease events, statin therapy was associated with reduced risk of all cause and cardiovascular mortality and cardiovascular disease events with greater absolute benefits in patients at greater baseline risk. Should I go on? Two years of pravastatin therapy induced a significant regression of carotid arthrosclerosis in children with familiar hypercholesteremia with no adverse effects on growth, sexual maturation, hormone levels, or liver or muscle tissue. Statins work. We've seen it replicated in countless studies with huge amounts of participants, and it's not just some pharma company skewing the results in their favor. Conspiracy theorists are big on big pharma, claiming that big pharma is rigging the results of 2 million people. The truth is these drug companies fund the studies because they are the ones that want their drug to work, and they're the ones that have the money for a large multi-phase trial. No outside random person is going to fund a study this large. They are very expensive. A lot of money and resources and investments are lost. I'm not defending pharmaceutical companies. I'm just saying that funding is not really a problem or a reason to not believe results, especially with statins where the results have been consistently replicated dozens of times, if not more than that. Now let's quickly get to the side effects, which is the main objection I hear about people not wanting to take a statin. Muscle pain is the main side effect with statins, and it has about a 10% rate of occurring in those that take a statin. It's also dose-related, meaning the higher the dose, the more likely someone is to experience muscle pain. But even then, it's a low risk compared to the huge benefit that you get. Another scare of statins is its apparent risk in increasing diabetes risk. A meta-analysis of 13 trials here found an increased risk of new onset diabetes after a median four-year follow-up of nine percent. This correlated to a new case of diabetes mellitus for every 255 patients treated for at least four years with statin therapy. Another side effect seems to be an increase in liver enzymes, but that is a small occurrence, only about one to three percent normally seen in the first three months of starting statin therapy, then usually goes back down to normal levels without any long-term effects. So if it seems like common knowledge that high LDL is detrimental to our health, then where did all this backlash come from? Mostly the internet. Some of it, however, also may have come from this article that states that it only found a 0.8% absolute risk reduction in all-cause mortality, 1.3% reduction for heart attack, and 0.4% for stroke. If you just look at this at face value, then we'd all think that there's no point of taking a statin with potential side effects to just decrease our risk of dying by 0.8%. However, if we take a closer look, we'll see that the study included anyone over the age of 18 with high cholesterol, and the average length of the trials was only five years. Do you see the problem here? How many 18, 25, 35, 45, or even 55-year-olds do you see dropping dead within five years for any reason, let alone a heart attack or a stroke being the cause of that? Very small amount of people. That's why the absolute risk reduction is small. Let's say I get 1,045-year-olds and do a study for a drug that might reduce heart attacks and the length of the study is only five years. A very small amount of people will have a heart attack by 50 years old, let's say 100 people. 
The group that took the drug only had 50 people get a heart attack. The absolute risk reduction is the difference in the percentages. So 1% minus 0.5%, which equals 0.5%. But the relative risk reduction is 50% because only half the people got heart attacks with the drug. Now let's say we increase the length of the study to 50 years. Obviously, way more people will get a heart attack by then. Let's say 500. Let's keep the same 50% relative risk reduction so the drug helps half the people not get a heart attack. So 250 people get a heart attack with the drug. Again, absolute risk reduction is the difference, so 50% minus 25%, which comes out to an absolute risk reduction of 25%. Nothing changed in my study other than the length, but the absolute risk reduction looks significantly better. Length plays a huge role in chronic diseases like diabetes or cardiovascular disease. That's why relative risk reduction in these cases is just as good of a metric because it's unethical to deprive participants of a drug that works this well. That same article states that relative risk reduction was 9% for all-cause mortality, 29% for heart attack, and 14% for stroke, which is very, very good results. As we saw from the previous study I mentioned, the higher the LDL and the longer the LDL is elevated, the higher the risk. Getting those numbers down as soon as possible is critical, and statins are a low-risk way to make that happen. I will leave you all with this quote. Substantial reduction in expected atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk in the next 30 years is achievable by intensive lipid lowering in individuals in their 40s and 50s with non-HDLC levels above or greater than 160 milligram per deciliter. For many, the question of when to start lipid lowering might be more relevant than whether to start lipid lowering at all. That's it for this video. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time.